much higher than influenza, for instance. Uh, in Israel, as to this morning, we have uh, 6,100 cases of uh, coronavirus disease and uh, 28 uh, of whom died, which is 0.5%, which is really a world record of uh, low mortality as regard to the number of uh, cases. And there are several explanations that I will not go into detail. I'd like to mention a few steps that, do, that we are doing uh, in Israel and specifically at Ariel University in order to uh, solve this problem. And obviously we know that prevention is the key. If you can prevent a coronavirus, that would be great. And that there, there are a few approaches of uh, preventing influenza that are uh, currently done in uh, Ariel University and in general in Israel. So one way is of course active immunization to develop an active vaccine for influenza. And in Israel right now, there are two uh, companies or groups that are working on that. One is the research group of Migal at the Galilee, the northern part of Israel. And actually they are pioneered in the way that they have already a vaccine against, influ against coronavirus of chickens which have been already developed, a component vaccine. And now they are doing research to transform this vaccine also for the human coronavirus. So th this is one approach. And another approach is done at the Biological Research uh, Institute in Israel, and they are working on a component vaccine. This will take more time, they say about six months uh, uh, for human studies but they are working on it as well. More immediate way maybe is the passive immunization that we are starting to work at Ariel on that. And this is the way of giving antibodies of uh, patients who have recovered of coronavirus. So taking their serum, isolating the antibody fraction and giving it to severely ill patients. We call it passive immunization. Immunization by antibodies, which is short term, of course. And uh, with uh, Professor Michael Führer, he is a world-known immunologist, a deputy director for basic science at the Ariel University Med Adelson Medical School. And together with him, we are now applying for the ISF, Israel Science Foundation, they had a call for uh, suggesting for grants, and we are uh, applying for having a more sophisticated way of uh, passive immunization against influenza by uh, developing T cell, uh, cellular immunity, T cell repertoire against coronavirus. In collaboration, we already have collaborated and have agreement of uh, several physicians who head of Corona centers in Israel, Dr. Dicker at Asharon Hospital, and uh, Dr. Livni at the Schneider Children's Hospital. She replaced me at the head of the, the, the Corona department now in children. So maybe I'll give Michael a fear to say a few sentences about mm -hmm. our research approach for passive immunization of the coronavirus, and then we'll open for questions and, uh, of course. Okay, Michael, please. Okay, thank you, Shai. Um, I'll just give a few sentences as Shai is suggesting. The, it's important um, to understand the immune response of uh, people who have not only uh, succumbed to the disease, but also those who, who have been hospitalized and have recovered from the disease. And also those who have not have been tested positive, but have, have not been necessary to hospitalize them. So we, what, what we want to understand is the differences in the, in the immune response of certain people, how they have uh, responded to the infection. And in that, in that way, we'll be able to, I think, contribute in two ways. First of all, by understanding which antibodies to actually recover, as, as uh, Shai was suggesting, and to use those in passive immunity. But also, I think this information will be very important 
in developing the type of vaccine, the type of vaccination that is necessary to produce in, in, in healthy people, the type of immune response which will be actually very effective. So we're actually very uh, excited about getting involved in this, in this new research. Um, we're basically, basi we're basing our um, proposal actually on what has been already done with similar infections over the last uh, 20 years. There have been two infections with viruses that are similar to the coronavirus, virus, the, the current one. One was called in, uh, the SARS infection and the MERS infection. So there's been research done in the type of immune response of patients to those uh, infections. We're basically basing our, our proposed study on what was done there, because these, these studies on coronavirus 2 or the COVID-19 have not been done yet. So we're actually looking forward to getting samples from patients and actually learning how the, how the, the level of the type, the type of, of immune response to this particular virus. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I would just say that in the past, I have been involved in the influenza outbreaks, the bird influenza, and the doing studies with active vaccines against influenza, as well as passive immunization. So I hope to incorporate this experience also for the current pandemic of the uh, coronavirus. Now, dear friends, I'm, we are open for questions or ideas we are with you we just gave a short introduction please tell us how how you are feeling uh, may i ask a question my name is uh, yuri uh, uh, we know that uh, flu influenza vaccination is uh, not uh, very efficient it's definitely much lower than 100 percent i know 50 percent and as far as i understand the reason is in uh, mutability variability of influenza virus what are the hopes that in the case of covid it will be more efficient <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, you know, time will tell, but you, you are right. The efficacy of uh, influenza vaccination <clears throat> each winter against seasonal influenza is about 50%, 60%, not more. Because each year there are minor changes of the envelope protein of the influenza virus. So the protection is not 100% uh, and not close to 100%. But let me say that even, you know, protection of 50% is better than zero. So myself as a physician, each year for the last uh, 35 years, I get the influenza vaccine to protect myself, but to protect also my patients. I treat patients and children who are immunocompromised after uh, liver transplantation and cardiac transplantation and leukemia. So I want to protect them as well. So still 50% protection is uh, better than zero. And also there were some studies that even those who get the influenza vaccine and get the disease, they have less severe disease than those who have not been vaccinated. So there is, be, there is some a partial protection, especially against medical <laughs> cases. So just uh, to finish this, it's important still to get the influenza vaccine. Now the question is excellent. What will happen with the coronavirus? It's true that the coronavirus are changing. The envelope proteins are changing. The virus has its uh, envelope, what we call the spike proteins, which are the major virulence a trait of the virus, and they are changing. And we know that uh, SARS in 2003 was another coronavirus. And the MERS a few years ago was also a coronavirus. And now there is a new change in the antigens, the surface antigens, and the new virus from bats probably became a, a human. So there are possibilities of, of changing. 
of changes. That's why the effort in Israel are now to use the core proteins, to use those proteins that are stable in all the coronaviruses. There are six families of, of coronaviruses. To use the uh, proteins that are not changing, that are uniform for all these strains. So with this, we hope to overcome the problem. Actually, just to go back to influenza, I am a medical director of a startup company in Israel. It's called Beyond Vax, who developed a new influenza vaccine using core proteins that don't, they, that don't change each year. And right now we are doing a study with 12,000 vaccinees in Europe to see the efficacy. It should be universal influenza vaccine, not to get each year. But at a startup, I hope it will work. I'm, as I said, the medical director of this uh, company. So hopefully it will work. But that's a great question. Yeah. Thanks. I have a question for, uh, I think maybe Michael. Um, the, uh, the work that you're doing, are you able to tap into a global database of coronavirus um, patient information, specifically those that have recovered and their antibodies? And I mean, is the world come together on this in terms of making this ava information available so that people doing research like yourself have access to you know, all the information? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, there are two answers to that. First of all, the, the first answer is yes. Uh, well, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. There's a, there is a global effort and a global co collaboration um, uh, to, to collate and, and uh, analyze the data. Uh, it's too early. There is no database yet, but it, it will be. It will be established. There's a lot of co collaboration between countries, and uh, the the ISF, the, the Ministry of, uh, of Health here, and the uh, CDC in the United States and other countries will are and will be getting together to to produce these databases, as it has been done for other other diseases. Uh, it's also going to be in, in interesting to discuss, to see what the differences are between countries and different cultures and different, uh, different, different populations. But it's, it, it is going to happen. It's, it's still too early to do that. There is some information from China and uh, some, other, some other Asian countries that have a little bit, little bit longer experience with COVID-19. Um, but uh, that will happen, and when we, and we will be able to pull our data together, that's a, that, that is that is going to happen. Yeah, I would thank add. You. Uh, thank you, Michael. I would add that uh, we get the information, uh, global information. Actually, there is a map of the WHO in which you can see the Z uh, patients all over the world, and we get the data about the new medications that are tried for this, and uh, so there is a global effort. I am currently on the education committee of the World Society of Pediatric Infectious Diseases, and we have a special page on children with coronavirus, how to treat them, and how, how to prevent the fatal cases. So, uh, and uh, actually it's uh, worldwide, it's distributed worldwide, it's the World Society of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. In fact, the, the annual meeting was in Melbourne, Australia, like uh, four years ago. So uh, that was the meeting of the Westpid World Society of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Hey, uh, Joel Weinberg. I was wondering about the, uh, many people are using hydrochloroquine to block the inflammatory response of the coronavirus. And are there any other approaches you're trying to see if we can block the inflammatory response? It seems to be causing a lung injury that leads to mortality. And along those same lines, uh, are we looking at the uh, injury to also causing its profound attack?
sorry, uh, Joel, I think Wait. you cut out the but you mind repeating the question? Yeah. Um, I was wondering there, if uh, we're trying to find if um, uh, is being used and it's thought to be blocking the inflammatory response of the coronavirus and also is to be a proclivity of the mm -hmm. the lung because of the angiotensin receptor affinity. And are we looking at other ways to block the inflammatory response of the coronavirus, which is leading to the high mortality rate? Yeah, it's again a good question. We don't have all the answers yet, but uh, indeed we use in our country and other places hydroxychloroquine uh, for the severe cases, and there is some help. There is no, no, there is no uh, controlled study that we Hello. usually need uh, to co to confirm uh, efficacy. But uh, we use it on a compassionate use, like in the states, and uh, it seems that it's helpful. In, in it's used mainly in the severe cases, not in all cases. Uh, it's not a specific treatment against the uh, 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 coronavirus, but wow. it uh, can be helpful. And we have experience with that medication. The side effects are not very severe. There are minor contraindications, but we use it. As an infection disease specialist, we recently wrote a protocol of the treatment of coronavirus in Israel. So mild cases, only supportive treatment. But the severe cases, those, those who are under ventilation, we really use the hydroxychloroquine. There are a few other medications that are now used by what we call a compassionate use, that we don't have any controlled studies, but we use azithromycin as well, and we hope these are helpful. At the same time, there are studies to develop really a new protease inhibitor for the coronavirus, but it, this is not yet available but really a, a great uh, question and approach. Hi, it's uh, Galia Stevenson here. Um, I'm just, you touched on this earlier regarding um, um, immunity and, and the changing strains, but I'm wondering if herd immunity is gonna work in our favor here uh, with the coronavirus. Well, probably yes. Herd immunity is what we call when the population has been exposed to the virus and developed antibodies, or the vaccine induced antibodies in the population. And then the general approach in infectious diseases is that if 80% of the population has anti have antibodies to the virus, you stop the chain of transmission and the epidemic will stop. Actually, as infectious disease specialist, I wrote a small article about how epidemic stops. When, how, when does an epidemic stop? And there are, we don't know about the corona, but we have to learn from history. So indeed the pandemic flu, the Spanish flu in 1918, stopped after about 80% of the population were exposed of the global world population. That's one approach that about 80% have antibodies, you have herd immunity, and you stop the transmission chain. Another way, which is better, is the uh, flu, the Asian influenza in 1976, where we had the vaccine. So the vaccine stopped the, the infection, which is much better. And the third possibility is the SARS, another coronavirus, in 2003, the epidemic stopped after a few months when there were no more SARS cases. The virus did not distribute in the community because it was a more severe disease with a mortality of more than 10%. So there were no mild cases that were not diagnosed. And once they were isolated and treated, in a few months, the virus didn't circulate in the population and the epidemic stopped. So these are actually- but does, that, does that rely on the virus not mutating, that, that third scenario? Yeah, that's a good question. We, usually mutations will develop, but not in the same pandemic. Everything can happen, but usually yeah. mutations develop in the, another pandemic. For that's instance, we can see that the coronavirus now is a, 
additional mutation to the five families of coronavirus that we know knew already. There are four families that we know, then there is the SARS and the MERS, and, but the mutation will take a few years to develop, usually not in the same epidemic. The Spanish flu disappeared after 80% developed antibodies, but actually each year we have a different type of Spanish flu, it's H1N1 influenza, that with minor changes actually uh, appears every year. So that's for the future. So okay. there are many questions, but I, I believe uh, personally that in probably a few weeks or a few months, maybe two, three months, we'll overcome this epidemic. I learned from the experience in China that about two and a half months, most of the outbreaks have been eradicated and the people are now starting to work. So that's the hope. But obviously, you know, we cannot predict the future. We, we can only study the past the best we can and be ready for the future. And as I mentioned, we are a few initiatives that we are involved with to develop active vaccine and passive vaccine, and maybe medications. That's what we can do. Part of the research is done at the Ariel University. I, I have one more uh, question. Uh, first, I would say that the uh, Chinese situation uh, is not very applicable to Israel or to Western countries. But my question is about BCG vaccination vaccination against uh, tuberculosis. There are some articles uh, seeing very strong correlation between uh, this vaccination, which uh, in many countries, like in Russia, people get the childhood, and uh, the spread of COVID. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, that's really a great question. <laughs> Only yesterday, we were exposed to a study of a colleague of mine. He is working in Melbourne, Australia, at the Murdoch Hospital. And they have already published that the BCG vaccine has wide protection of more than just uh, uh, tuberculosis. This is a big virus, a attenuated virus. It, really, it actually stimulates the whole immune response of the body. And they have shown in the past that it can protect for many other infections. So yesterday they have applied for a research among Australian healthcare people who will be getting the BCG with the hope that it will prevent coronavirus. So we don't know if it works, but really that's something real new from yesterday. They are applying for a study and We'll see if it works or not, but the, the idea is that BCG is a big DNA virus, attenuated, but it stimulate, stimulates the immune response so widely that you can get protection also from other diseases. So that's the idea that the BCG will uh, give some protection against the uh, coronavirus and uh, the, the, this uh, physician at the in Melbourne at the Modo Hospital are just starting, initiating research to prevent coronavirus about, uh, in healthcare workers. Because the previous coronavirus, the SARS, 20% of the casualties of the fatal cases were healthcare workers who were infected from the outbreak by treating patients. So they want to protect them by the BCG and we see if it works, but that's uh, really uh, real new news from yesterday. Um, Thank you. Okay, I want to I, I close the session for half an hour, so um, we're going to be close soon. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, thank you both Professor Schneider and Professor Ferro for all information. Um, since we set this um, this uh, seminar, I've been contacted by a number of people who'd like to set up um, after Pesach. Uh, some panel discussions, so we're hoping to have some more things coming down the line. I want to thank everybody for giving us their time. I hope that's been interesting and informative. 
and uh, we look forward to uh, updating you as we as we best we can um, as the price develops and hopefully we see uh, some more light there in the tunnel as soon as possible and just wish everybody a Chag Sameach and um, we should see each other again um, in less isolated circumstances. Chag Sameach. Take care of yourself. Be healthy. Thank you so much. Thanks for organizing, Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We said in the past, Pesach Sameach. Now we say Pesach Sameach with Bari. Kosher Pes Passover and healthy Passover. Amen. 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 Bye bye. Bye. Bye, 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 Bye,